All right, so welcome everybody to the kickoff meeting. Um, I would just like to say, and I echo um, Mike Peckman, thank you so much for agreeing not only to be on the steering committee, but to respond to the doodle poll in such a quick fashion the way you have, as well as you know, being available at such you know, less than 24 hour notice for this meeting today. So we, we really appreciate that. Um, and we'll be talking a little bit about um, the timeline as we get into the presentation. So um, does everybody still want me to mute everybody due to background noise? Because I'm not hearing any on my end. I'm okay. This is Jody. I'm okay. I'm just in case I have a staff member that comes back and I just don't want to disrupt. But I'm I'm good as long as you guys are okay with me having to tell someone to. Because <laughs> I I like to you know, if someone has a question as I'm talking, I like to answer it you know in real time. Because if you're like me, you know that thought goes out the window. <laughs> You know, a second later. So, um, so we are gathered here today to kind of kick off the community health needs assessment that Schuylkill Health is doing. And I know when Mike had, you know, personally called you up and asked if you would be part of this committee, I know he mentioned the fact that this China, as I call it, the needs assessment is on a fast track. Uh, it was supposed to be done by Thursday of this week. It's going to be a couple, you know, weeks past that. So our timeline is, is very short, um, doing everything that we would do for a client that we would have had for a year. So um, nothing is being skimped, um, you know, as far as the China. The only difference, and I kind of alluded to that in the email I sent to everybody yesterday asking for information from you all, is we're not doing any focus groups due to the timing or a community survey. So we're really relying on those stakeholder interviews to understand the needs of the community, and we'll be talking about that a little later. So my name is Kathy Roach, and I am from Strategy Solutions, the consulting firm that Schuylkill Health has um, hired to do their assessment. We did theirs uh, way back when in 2013, and we've done quite a few other needs assessments back in 2013 as well as this go around. It's something you know that I love to do. The screen is just a quick snapshot in case you've not heard of Strategy Solutions. We're based in Erie, Pennsylvania, and uh, we mainly work with nonprofit organizations with strategic planning, board governance, and of course the needs assessments. First and foremost, I wanted to talk through what your role is, what you can expect, and what we're hoping to get out of you. So, you know, basically working with, you know, Mike, myself, and any other internal people to make sure that we're you know, on the right track and we're getting all the information that we can regarding the needs assessment, providing insight and uh, input concerning local community needs and the resources available. I know some of you are also going to be stakeholders, so thank you very much. We're going to be getting input. And I did receive some emails back from some people on, you know, have you thought of these underserved um, populations or here's, you know, maybe some people you should talk to for a stakeholder interview that we'll kind of review in a couple minutes. Uh, you also provide um, access to community stakeholders. So maybe it's someone that you gave the name to Mike and I, they're on the list, you know, but after 24 hours of dog and after them we haven't heard, we may give you a jingle and say, hey, since you gave us that name, can you rattle their chain so that we can get this interview um, conducted. You're also going to work with the China team to utilize data and knowledge of the community and then to prioritize the community needs. And you're going to work with the China team um, regarding the implementation action plans um, if that fits into maybe what you bring to the table. As far as your time commitment, today we have a 30-minute kickoff meeting. Um, because when we get to the timeline next, we are under such a short, short time frame. We really are asking for a quick turnaround, which you guys have been great at thus far in responding to emails. Um, and we will, I'll be setting a doodle poll out again today for next week's meeting towards the end of the week, talking about here's all the data, here are the disparities that we found, the problem areas you should think about compared to what were the areas last go around, and is there anything else you've heard that are major issues like, you know, opiate use is exploding in the last six months that we should add to the priority listing. And then what we're going to do is we're going to send you away with the info to kind of mull it over, and then the next day I'm going to send you a link to a SurveyMonkey where you're going to be prioritizing 
all of the needs. And that will be put um, into the report that I will simultaneously be, be writing because it, it's due to management of the hospital, the first draft, on July 13th. So it is, it is a very quick turnaround. Um, your time commitment is really two and a half hours for this go around. Um, and if you would like to be part of the implementation strategy with maybe what you bring to the table, then we would have some conversations off and on between August and October, um, but nothing where we have to meet every other week and we have four-hour meetings. It's nothing like that. It's mainly getting your input. Um, and if there's a collaboration down the road, you know, what you could bring to the hospital for that collaboration. So that's really just the time commitment and kind of overall duties of the steering committee. Any questions? All right then. Um, just, you know, the IRS back in the end of 2014 on New Year's Eve came out with the final regs, um, you know, saying that, of course, the China has to be conducted every three years. You need to identify any chronic disease conditions as well as what needs are out there in the community. Identify your assets and your strengths, which we do through our stakeholder interviews. And then also, you know, identify any underrepresented or underserved populations which is the question that I sent out to the steering committee, you know, to get uh, feedback on. And that's really to make sure that, you know, if we're hearing the same thing over and over, uh, for instance, you know, geez, the Hispanic population, you know, don't really think that um, there are enough services out there for them or their culture dictates that they don't receive health care, they don't seek it out. And if we hear that from, you know, quite a few people, then, you know, maybe we need to have someone that represents the Hispanic community or helps them out as a stakeholder. So that's why it's really important to get your feedback um, through that. And usually this kickoff meeting is about an hour, hour and a half, uh, scaled back the presentation and kind of did that ask in the email yesterday. So, um, you know, and of course all hospitals um, and health departments are moving towards more of a population-based planning and healthcare delivery um, system, seeing how can the hospital, with help from the community and community organizations, move that needle. Um, you know, also talking about, you know, prevention, more towards screenings and catching things before they become a real problem and then burdening the health system, you know, with those costs. And then managing the health of a population, you know, to lower the healthcare costs and improve, you know, healthcare is um, also what we strive for with, with the China. We have a lot of documentation that we have to gather in a couple weeks. Uh, we, of course, define what the community is and what our process was in getting all the information, but getting input from yourselves as well as interest of the community to prioritize your significant health needs um, along with, you know, what you've identified as the ones that the hospital is going to be working on, whether by itself, uh, or with uh, collaboration from a community agency. We also have to pull the resources like we did last go around on what's available for the community to, you know, to access as far as health, but this time around the IRS is also saying the hospital services needs to also be listed in the report um, because they also contribute to the assets of the community. So that is new this time, as well as an evaluation of your last China. So we are in the process of gathering information on that and maybe calling some of, of uh, the steering committee members knowing that maybe you had a piece of the pie last time. Um, and Kay, I'm thinking of you with vision as far as what did you do to move the needle that would be included in this report. The report that we write um, is also will be available with detailed um, data and information to be used by the community in case they would like to write a grant and need some type of data um, that's there for them as well. Um, so our project approach um, is very quick, and we have our kickoff meeting today. We've already been doing some things behind the scenes with the hospital as far as identifying um, steering committee stakeholders to date, um, downloading and dropping down data to put into um, a spreadsheet which will give us um, where the trends are and dispar disparities that we should be thinking about. Uh, we're doing the demographic analysis, knee, uh, community asset mapping. Uh, phase two is we're doing um, stakeholder interviews. I think right now we're at about 15. Um, and, you know, can really go as far as, you know, what we need to gather information as far as the underserved population. 
I also need to have everybody look at their calendars. I'm going to be doing a doodle poll for the latter part of next week for our next steering committee meeting. You go over all of the primary data that we heard from the stakeholders as well as the secondary data talking about what are all the priorities uh, and needs. And that will be a one hour webinar that we'll have next week um, to get your input, especially when we get to the prioritization. Is there anything else that we need to add? And then sending out that survey uh, for you to fill out. And when we do the survey, and I'll talk about that a little more next week, but in the back of your head, you know, you need about 30 minutes to do the survey. Uh, it is quite lengthy because you're going to be taking, say you have 50 priorities, you're going to be voting on by uh, accountability, uh, impact, magnitude, and capacity. So you're going to be voting on that four times. But that will also be a quick turnaround so that we can get um, a draft to management of the hospital by July 13th do some tweaking, and then that following week it has to go out uh, for board approval on the 25th. It has to be in the board package. So uh, we're really kind of under the gun on that, but I uh, feel confident we can get everything done. But, you know, may call on you to, to help nag some stakeholders um, or to get information about maybe what things you would have done in the community over the last three years for the evaluation process. And then we move right into our implementation strategy between August and November, having the final report in early October so that in November it can be approved by the board. Everyone is going to get a copy of the slide deck and the recording in case there's someone in your organization um, that you want to keep up to speed on what we're talking about and what the process is about. So I'm really not going to go over the project timeline, just to say that usually the project timelines are listed by month. These are literally listed by week on what we're doing to make sure we stay on task and get everything done before that report has to be done by July 13th. So uh, you'll notice on week 27 of June 27th in bold, we'll have our kickoff meeting today. Next week towards the latter part, we're going to convene again to go over that data. And then the next day, um, you'll have to complete that survey for the prioritization. And then after that, we'll be going right into uh, the implementation strategy. Anyone have any questions on that quick timeline or any concerns that you may have before I move on? All right, great. So the rest of the slides are just talking about how, how we do the evaluation, what we're looking for, you know, what has been done from what you said you were going to do with the implementation strategy. So, you know, literally talking about, you know, what health fairs have you done? Have we kept track of how many people attended? What other activities did you say you were going to do that you did? As well as what couldn't you get to and why uh, is all part of that evaluation. We pull down um, research from the Census Bureau, from the Healthy People 2020, PA Department of Health, the CDC, County Health Rankings. You know, anywhere that we can get data, we pull down to see where the disparities are. And we compare that to the trends that we're seeing you know, um, a lot of my other clients this time around, their mammogram screenings are going down and their breast cancer incident rates are going up. You know, so they're going to concentrate on um, getting the word out and making mammogram screenings more available. So, um, you know, it's those types of trends we'll call out as well as, you know, disparities against the state, the nation, and the Healthy People 2020 goals um, is where all of the what we kind of start out as our prioritization then is based on all of those disparities. Uh, I mentioned that we'll be doing community asset mapping, so we're going to take the listing that was done last time um, and uh, you know, use like United Way listings, Y listings. So if, if there is anything that you have or if you're a nonprofit agency in town you know, or, or really any, any agency in the area that you, maybe you have a directory or you've seen a directory come across your desk, would you mind emailing that to me so that we can then put that into the asset mapping? Um, I'd rather use um, different lists that are out there. Uh, we don't have a lot of time to recreate the wheel, but we will be researching you know, some things that I see are missing. But um, if you have any lists that you know, your agency creates or ones that you may use, if you can email that to me, that would be great. And then we also have a map with all of the dots showing where all of those assets um, are located in the community. Persons representing the broad input, you know, this is where we need your help. Um, you know, we have a public health person on the steering committee. Um, I know that Marion um, is on leave right now, so is unable to participate. Um, but also, you know, who do you know that 
you know, pockets of underserved populations, either medically, poverty-wise, low-income, minority, that we really should get to know what their needs are so that um, we can document that in the report. Stakeholder interviews. Um, I sent out the list to everybody yesterday, um, and I did receive some response back. One person said, well, maybe, you know, thinking about interviewing someone from law enforcement to get their take on what the problems are because they would be touching pretty much any population, whether it's underserved or underrepresented. Um, another suggestion was um, attorney Eric Mika, who specializes in elderly cases and elder abuse. Um, and I do believe we have somebody listed, Mike, that's on there that um, can speak to the aging population. Is that correct? Uh, let me see. I'll have to pull that list. I think that probably would be me, Mike. <laughs> Nancy. Covers okay. a lot of areas, Kay. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Um, you know, education programs for the elderly, uh, Karen Woods from mm -hmm. um, Diakon in Pottsville. So those were just some suggestions. So if you have any other suggestions, if you could please email me, that would be great. Um, as far as maybe other people that we should contact, you know, based on an underserved population or a problem that you're seeing in the community that should be addressed or at least, you know, heard for us to make some type of contact with them. Um, would be great. And it's just like a 20, 30 minute phone call. Um, you know, we just ask them questions, what you know, they think the needs are, you know, what are the assets in the community right now, what is missing from the community, those types of questions. I've also sent Mike the hospital utilization analysis that we need. So his informatics and IT slash finance department is going to be giving me that information just to see if we have any trends on you know, what is the hospital seeing as far as conditions that enter uh, the hospital? And that's both for uh, ambulatory care sensitive conditions, it's for mental health um, as well. And we, um, uh, I'm sorry, did someone have a question? Yeah, Kathy, uh, just an FYI on the uh, key stakeholders. Uh, late this morning, we did add uh, uh, a Tony DeMalis from the Shenandoah uh, area school district uh, on the stakeholder list. In talking with uh, Kay Jones, uh, uh, we look to uh, introduce someone truly based in the northern part of the county. And then uh, there was some discussion about uh, some things going on in that district. Uh, uh, shocked at the statistic, but 100% of their students are on subsidized lunches. So that goes to some of the uh, contributing conditions to health, not just health. And he was very agreeable to be on the stakeholder list. Oh, perfect. Thank you very much, Mike. You're welcome. <clears throat> so we have that. Um, we will be identifying the significant needs, as I mentioned, after we talk about the data. We'll talk a little bit about what other needs are missing that should be on there, and then the quick turnaround on that prioritization survey. Um, and then after that, we go into that implementation plan, um, which then looks at what, what is the hospital going to do over three years. And then every year that document gets updated, so it is a very fluid document. And that just goes into a little more of that. Um, because I do want to leave some time for any questions or any conversations you would like to have as far as, you know, what do you feel the needs are in Schuylkill County, as well as, you know, are there any other populations that we should be hearing from? Um, because we can't do focus groups. We can't go to a food bank and actually talk to the people that are there. You know, so talking to, you know, someone who runs you know, maybe a large food bank or a food pantry or every Saturday night offers a meal, you know, in their church or, you know, they rotate between churches um, every month. You know, we, we're looking for feedback from, from, from everybody on the steering committee. So um, I guess at this point I open it up to questions as well as a, a discussion on, you know, other needs. I know that Gail had also sent uh, as far as community needs go, she mentioned educational programs to the elderly that may include safety at home, medication education, uh, education for teens and young adults on many topics including drug and alcohol abuse, texting while driving, youth activities, importance of immunizations, uh, and finding of physicians. 
she sees many patients coming to the ER, you know, coming to the hospital that don't have a physician. So those were just some some community needs that um, you know Gail sees, and you know, would like to open it up now. This is Kay. So basically, we are focusing on chronic illness rather than social determinants of health, right? We're we're definitely also um, doing social determinants of health because all of that falls under the social determinants. So if you have, you know, specific social determinants that you see that there's a need in the entire community, a portion of the community, you know, that would be a good good time to, you know, to let us know about that. Okay, so poverty, low education, high unemployment, um, lack of access to care, mm -hmm. all of those social determinants. How are you going to to um, get how are you going to actually find the data on those? Well, we actually we have um, it's funny that you asked that question, Kay. We actually have a client in Alaska who their entire focus now this China is a year long, uh, but their in China their entire focus is on the social determinants of health. So how we are setting up their community health needs assessment and getting the data is actually going to be plugged in under the social determinants of health. Like categories, you know, poverty, um, and you know, and some of the statistics are children living in single-parent homes and children right. receiving free and reduced lunch, which would show 100%. Um, right. So kind of, kind of um, putting the data as opposed to just the um, the topics of access and chronic disease and mental health and healthy mothers, baby children. We're actually um, putting them under the social determinants of health. Um, and asking that question um, in the stakeholder guide. I, I think that that's, you know, some of that we can address, like getting the federally qualified health center with a step toward access. Um, mm -hmm. But some of it, like the crumbling infrastructure of mo most of our towns here, the, the issue of blight, those kinds of issues are major issues for our county and do affect health. So I, I was just curious as to how you address them then in follow-up action steps. So part of the part of part of our um, agreement and and work with Schuylkill is actually being part of that implementation strategy K and and it's a very in depth process. So we will take the prioritized needs and you know look at them and say you know out of say 82 needs that everybody voted on, we really want to tackle the top 20 because it really encompasses all the needs. You know, instead of it just being specific cancers, you know, we're gonna we're gonna tackle all cancers through more preventative screenings. But we take those priorities and then we say, okay, what was the hospital doing in the last go around that they want to continue? All right, what else are we gonna do to, you know, attempt to move the needle on those other priority areas, you know, that that the hospital would like to address? And then saying, okay. The, ho the hospital wants to be involved, but because of their bandwidth, they don't offer that, but let's collaborate with an agency in the area. So then we bring the agency that they would like to collaborate with into that, that discussion to create the goals for that implementation strategy. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for the question. Uh, it's Nancy, Kathy. Yes, hi, Nancy. I think uh, the cost of drugs um, for seniors, in, in most cases, has become prohibitive. And the rising cost, you know, in Part D, Medicare for some folks, uh, and if they're not taking their meds as they should be, that's going to impact greatly, mm -hmm. you know, on the health care needs in this area. Right. Now, is there any, does anybody know, do you have any type of community paramedicine programs in, in the community? Can you define paramedicine? Mm -hmm. Sure. So what some of the other um, counties are doing is they have realized that, and, you know, and now with Medicaid and Medicare, you have to lower your readmission rate on each person, otherwise you're sure. going to get dinged. So what some of the communities have come up with is called community paramedicine where it, they have been partnering with the ambulatory service in town. And the ambulatory service has a special department called community paramedicine. And when someone gets admitted into the ER or is going to be discharged and they're identified 
as a person who would be a high readmit. Maybe they live alone, um, maybe they have some intellectual disabilities, they're seniors, you know, for whatever reason, poverty, and you know, they're they're identified because they're they're a high readmission. So then, what happens is is that the hospital contacts the community paramedicine. They're there at discharge to hear the discharge orders, and then they take the person home, and then they pop in, however many times a week, to make sure they're taking their medication. You know, make sure that their house is you know up to snuff for maybe what their needs are, maybe they're in crutches and so things have to be moved, they're there to take care of that. You know, maybe they suffered a heart condition and need to start walking, so they, they pop in a couple times a week and say, let's, you know, walk down to the end of the block and back. You know, they're, they're kind of doing whatever they can to help keep that readmission mm -hmm. rate on that person down. So it's like a care manager. Correct. But a lot of, a lot of counties are using, um, the ambulatory service because they have the vans. No, we don't have anything like that. Okay. <laughs> Darn it. <laughs> mm -hmm. I was just going to add that, but I thought no. <laughs> so even with the lottery, the prescriptions were still extremely high for the seniors. No. Aren't they supposed to get money from, I thought my grandmother got her medications paid through PACE. Or am I dating Some my do, but PACE, yeah. Some, yeah. At the donut hole. And PACE net, right? You're right. Okay. What other needs? So this is Jody. Um, one of the significant needs that we have is housing um, for individuals in the community, especially for those who um, maybe have either lost housing due to chronic illness um, or, or any situations. We have one crisis residential for individuals in order to avoid maybe being hospitalized or um, as a step down from hospitalization, uh, we're very much lacking that. Um, the resources for um, psychiatrists in the community is significantly, uh, it, it's, we're mm -hmm. out probably, we're now at like 70 to 90 days when we're supposed to have an appointment post-discharge in seven. Oh my goodness. Um, so we've been working with PCPs to try and at least get individuals to receive their medications. So mm -hmm. In. Um, and I'm sure you have the name, but you know Bill Rowan could certainly give you a, a excellent idea of the the drug problem, opiates in particular in this area. Okay. So occurring, um, we have a huge issue uh, with co-occurring mental health and, and single occurring just opiate uh, abuse in the area as well. But the resources for outpatient services, psychiatric services, is so significant that our primary insurance payer, which is CCBH, actually gives us a little bit of forgiveness on our recidivism rate because it's so poor okay. in this area. Okay. And it was funny that you mentioned about, you know, um, Jody, the, um, you only have one crisis. Uh, step down when uh, Debbie and I actually went to ACHI, we both sat in on a talk uh, up in Vermont, and people that had no housing, they were homeless, um, were going to be discharged, and they had nowhere to go, and they needed food to take their pills. Mm -hmm. um, so what, what happened was is they created a coalition between the hospital and the um, shelter agency in town and mental health, and the hospitals Skin in the game was $20,000. And what they did was they bought a rundown hotel mm -hmm. with 19 rooms, you know, like a little, little strip motel, and uh, that was a blight. That's where drugs were, prostitution. And they made it the step down from the hospital. And they actually had a 24-7 case manager on staff to help with anything, uh, as well as nurses would rotate in for the medical needs. And they could only stay two weeks. And they were, they were honest when they said some people were turned out because they could not find permanent housing for them, um, you know, anywhere. And some, you know, were able to go to housing. And then um, the hospital didn't do the next section, but the other two um, agencies did. They bought another one of those, you know, motels and turned it into permanent housing for the people. But the return on investment for the hospital the first year was three-quarter of a million dollars. I believe it, yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, I've seen that done also. Um, very familiar with the state of Missouri and the amount of work that they've done in that area. And yeah, it's a, it's a great service and much needed. So. Yeah. It's just, you know, getting someone to start it and, you know, getting the money, you know, it, everyone has the same, you know, the same financial issues. So any other um, needs that we see? Because I'm, and I apologize, it's 1235 and I'm really trying to keep this to 30 minutes for, you know, for everybody. Um, any other needs or people that you feel that we should know about? This is Lori. I mean, I certainly see how important all the issues that we've talked about, and they need to take a major priority, but I do think that there are a lot of hardworking people who don't have health insurance, who have health insurance with the deductibles, and the co-pays being so high that they're not even able to use them. Right. So I still think we have a lot of people out there who aren't getting the health care they need simply because they can't afford the under their insurance. Right, and Lori, I'm seeing that. I mean, I think I have 12 clients this year that I've done China's for, and that is in the top five for every single hospital. Mm -hmm. Is that mm -hmm. same thing? You have, you know, that 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 income level of people that are lost in the shuffle because yeah, maybe they can get Obamacare for 10 bucks a month, but then they have to pay out of pocket six thousand dollars, so they don't go and mm -hmm. get health care because right. of it. Right, and, or you know, people who have a decent income, but that you know they're their deductible is $6,000. So, you know, they have to now make decisions. Do I go to the doctor or do I, you know, take care of other things that we have to take care of here at our house? Right. Or do we take our meds? Right. <laughs> no, I it, it mean, right. it, that's just, yep. it's a big circle. It really is. And, you know, that's the million-dollar question. How do, you, how do you help those folks? Right. And we it's sad because focus they're focus hardworking. Focus. You know, yep. they're out there working. They're doing everything they can, and they're not getting – adequate health care compared to people who aren't going to work. Mm -hmm. And it's very frustrating for them. Right. I would definitely reach out. There's a clubhouse in town. It's called Hidden River Clubhouse. Um, and a lot of people utilize that, um, both who are in poverty level, they may be recovering, um, they may, it, it's for a lot of, they use it for job searches. It's called Hidden River Clubhouse. Um, they're a community service group, if you will. Okay. Um, the okay. director's name is Martina Buffington, um, and I can send you her contact information. Okay, that would be great. But I think that would be a great person to speak to in terms of what she sees in the community because she sees, you know, all the people we're talking about and experiencing, even those, you know, like Lori just mentioned, it's so true, um, but definitely seeing, seeing that side as well. Excellent. We also, Kathy, have no inpatient house hospice units in this county. What? Mm -mm. <laughs> Sorry. Well, they do it at um, most nursing homes. Will do yeah, it. but they're uh, hospice units. But I mean an actual hospice, you know. Like a palliative care floor or mm -hmm. thing or something? They, well, nursing homes take, you know, people and, and place them on hospice, you know, as their needs arise. But these would be an actual hospice unit, right. but that's all they had. So they don't have dementia folks, you know, in with folks, although dementia, well, we're not going to go into diagnoses, but um, these are units just specifically right. for okay. hospice. Okay. Okay. Anything else? I think transportation is an issue. I think if you're in town in Pottsville, it mm -hmm. may not be, but in some of our more rural areas, access to care, access to follow up, if it's with your PCP or with if it's, you know, maybe to come back to do cardiac rehab or wound care, if they don't have access to a car, you know, we we see that a lot with individuals who just simply do not have transportation. They may not be able to access the public bus route. Okay. And you don't have any type of like an eerie, um, you know, we, we kind of have the same thing, but we have, it's a messenger service. And last year they did a big report on them because instead of it being a messenger service or, 
um, you know, like a little local delivery, they're actually more of they take people to their appointments and bring them back because, you know, the public transportation we have here, the lift, you could be picked up two hours beforehand and then have to wait two hours after your appointment. So um, they actually are using a messenger service to help with that transportation. So, all right, excellent. And is it more of, uh, for lack of a better term, you know, over the mountain type thing with the transportation? Uh, does the does bus does public busing go like up north or east or west? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It does. Okay. You have to be able to then if you don't qualify for say medical transport, you know, you're looking uh -huh. for, you know, you have to still get to wherever that is to then catch the bus. Gotcha. Right. Which is I'm sure on a steep hill. <laughs> it could be. <laughs> Which is in one one community. That's that's what they did. They had a you know they couldn't do use it in the winter time because it was never salted. So, all right. Anything else? All right. Well, I have twelve forty, so I have kept you ten minutes beyond um, my promised time, and I I really again appreciate the fact um, that you're committed to this process. And, um, you know, all the input you gave today has been great. So I look forward um, to talking with everyone next week, and I will send out a doodle poll of, um, of times latter part of next week that we would get together then to review all the data, if that's okay with everybody. That's good. Sounds good. All right. Well, I'm going to stop the recording now.